So um, let me introduce myself. Who am I? Um, well, I'm a software engineer disguised as a mathematician. So I was hired to teach mathematics, and they still haven't figured out that I'm actually a software engineer. <laughs> Students did, and that's not too bad. Um, so I actually work in, a, in abstract algebra. I did computational semigroup theory. Uh, I'm, I'm still doing that. And of course, I teach traditional mathematics classes. And I try to do it often in a non-traditional way, because we, anyway, we live in the 21st century. So I, I, I teach uh, closure and the game of Go in these math uh, classes. So I have a few assumptions uh, about you. And uh, the first is that you do enjoy abstractions. And it's, um, you don't need to worry, because if you are a software, uh, if you are a software engineer, programmer, you already do this. So it's like uh, there is no other way to do that. And, uh, and you see abstractions crucial for both programming and mathematics. Okay? And what I'm getting at is that, uh, for me, um, these are essentially the same. And I know people would argue that, oh, OK, that's uh, mathematics and computer programming done by different people, so this is not quite right. And I say that, oh, OK, my view is extreme because probably of my philosophy education. Um, so I cannot distinguish really between things if you lo look at it in an abstract level. Uh, but I mean, what do, what do we gain if we keep them separate? And what do we gain if we you know, say that, well, these are actually quite uh, close to each other. So I assume that you are willing to learn some piece of mathematics, even if it doesn't help your uh, day tomorrow uh, in, in work. So it's, it's more like a long-term uh, investment. And um, OK, um, so here's the, the trouble, abstract versus concrete. And uh, well, we are human beings, so there is this um, real cognitive difficulty. And um, well, it has been recognized that well, mathematics is not difficult because it's really just common sense. Uh, well, if you do it in an extreme way, and if you do it with high precision, meaning that you use the right amount of information, uh, no more, no less, then you have to do uh, abstraction, and you get very uh, abstract. So what we can do about it? So yeah, probably you recognize this, this talk is, is a meta talk as well. So I'm talking about the mathematics. I'm talking about how to, uh, to learn mathematics. Um, examples are helpful. And we learned yesterday uh, from Susan's talk that well, you have to start with the example. And um, yeah, I can testify. Students say that if you start with the definition, we zone out. And by the time you get to the examples, it's, well, we just never get back. And that's, um, that happens. And it also happens that the general principle is easy to understand. Uh, that's where we use analogy, and that might help. So here is the general principle. Here is the, the Yoneda of philosophy. And things are defined by their relationship with other uh, things. So that's, the, that's one slogan. Tell me who your friends are, and I will tell you who you are. And if you want to learn about it, uh, probably you, many of know, you uh, know this paper. And they collected all these cultural uh, references about, uh, about the United philosophy. So that's, you know, that's something you can relate to. That's we immediately understand what this is about. And um, oh, OK, the system is trying to tell me something. Uh, then you get to a dilemma. Okay, and that's, um, this is one way to put it. And on the left side, you get the natural transformations from the home functor to a functor f. And on the right side, you just apply a functor to an, to an object. And um, so yeah, I mean, it's, uh, where are the friends, right? And <laughs> it's not as obvious. Um, so when I first got to this point, I asked that, oh, can I just keep this? Because, well, it's called a lemma, right? In mathematics, you call it a lemma, which is just a, a minor result. And um, it's maybe needed for a, a more important theorem. So I can just skip it. Well, if you ask uh, the experts in the field, they have a rather different opinion. OK, so either um, when naming this lemma, someone has just tried to make fun, or the actual importance came uh, out later. I think that's what uh, happened. So it's a, it's a very important part uh, in category theory. So you say that, oh, OK, uh, I have to do it. I want to do it. And you go to Wikipedia, and it says that 
The UMA dilemma is a vast generalization of Cayley's theorem for group theory. And it's hooray, because Cayley's theorem is, is really, really easy. It's that simple, and that's what uh, we are going to do uh, in this talk. That's what I'm, I'm going to talk about. Cayley's theorem for group theory. So we need to uh, define groups. Right? So, well, mathematicians are very bad at naming things. So group theory has nothing to do with psychology, uh, but that's how it's, it's called. And here's the abstract definition. I, I do it in the wrong way. I show you the abstract definition first. Uh, but well, I think you are <laughs> well trained for this, so this will work fine. And um, <clears throat> but I, since we do the meta thing as well, I want to uh, emphasize that again, it's bad naming. We call it call the operation. A group is just a, a set with a binary operation. We often call multiplication. Okay, traditionally, and it's almost never multiplication. Okay, it's a binary operation. I would rather call it composition, and I know many people would like this <coughs> idea to call it composition because that's what it is. And um, I'll give you another definition, right? Um, sometimes mathematicians, they just don't want to waste symbol for the operation, okay? And that's, that's a good thing because it's a lot nicer, uh, but it may be, uh, you know, for the newcomer, maybe less easy to uh, understand. Okay, but what, what is this uh, set G? Associativity holds. Well, uh, we need that. Otherwise, a sequence of, uh, of letters would have no precise meaning. You have to put the, the parentheses as well. And we have the identity element, which basically does nothing. Okay? And if you teach group theory to school kids, they get really fascinated about by this idea. So. We, you ask, oh, which one is your favorite symmetry? Ah, oh, the identity, doing nothing. That's uh, <laughs> it's really, uh, I did this experiment twice, and then it worked twice. Um, and you have the, the inverse. Uh, it's called inverse, but it's just undoing. If you do something, uh, then you can undo it. And if you do that together, no matter which order, well, they, then you do nothing. So that's the idea. OK. so. Traditionally, uh, the next thing you mentioned, the not so good examples. And you point out that, oh, don't worry, if, if groups, the definition of group sounds like oh, it's a new thing and it's scary, because you already know this. And you give the um, example of integers uh, under addition, where the identity is zero. Slight clash in, in notation, because while well, we use the identity, the, the one as a symbol, and now one is zero. And the inverse for integers is negative. And then you talk about um, the non-zero rational numbers under multiplication. And the identity is 1. OK, that works out. The inverses are the reciprocals. Uh, but you see uh, here, multiplication is multiplication. And in the other example, multiplication is addition. So well, yeah, composition might be a, a better name. So here, here is a, a better example. Okay, I really don't like the previous ones because it's rather confusing. Uh, but you can use symmetry as a compression tool. And of course, I have to have a slide with the go board on it. Uh, but if you look at these uh, board positions, they are essentially the same. We just have a couple of operations. If I rotate the bo board or I flip the colors, um, then I get these. So why do I say it's essentially a compression tool? Because imagine you want to uh, store um, board positions. You, just want, you don't want to store all these. You just want to say that, oh, I just store one representative and basically just um, forget the, um, these transformations because, well, it's just a different thing. OK, so talk about group theory. And here's the intuitive. Uh, thinking about it. And this might be the, the takeaway. If you just want to remember one thing about this talk, then remember this. Numbers measure size. OK, that we understand. You know, it's not, there is a thing. And I measure oh, it's how many centimeters. Cool. And groups measure symmetry. OK? So that sort of extends the idea of measurement. Because what is measurement? Well, it's basically a function. You take an object and you assign a mathematical object. When you measure size, that's a number. OK, now you look at another object, and, uh, and you assign another mathematical object, which is slightly more complicated. It's not a number. It will be a, a group, which is a set with a binary operation. OK, so which one is more symmetric? 
there are these two shapes, and um, which one is more symmetric? I, I haven't said what is it. No, uh, haven't defined. Uh, yeah, uh, that one is more symmetric. How did you do that? Yeah. Okay. So what what he did? Uh, he made a mental operation. So if you if you rotate the first one, then you, then you see that oh you can you can rotate three times and it will look look the same. That's the key idea. Symmetry operation is just you do something a transformation, which looks like you did nothing. Okay, in, in a way. And um, the, on the left-hand side, well, you can, you can rotate, um, but you cannot flip it over. If you flip it over, well, then you recognize, oh, I did something. So this is how you teach the kids, because half of the group uh, looks away, and the other half, half can see what I do to the object, and they know, and then, you know, they ask that, oh, um, they ask the other group, so what happened, and to figure out whether I moved it or not, and that's... Uh, how you can uh, introduce the notion of symmetry to kids. So yeah, that's what happens. But if you are more um, precise, then you do the trick and you label it. Okay. So now you put some numbers, and if, if you do uh, the transformations, then you see exactly um, what's going on because the numbers move. So it, now you have to, to see it in two different ways. One is just you just look at the shape, like checking whether it's a symmetry operation or not. Uh, but then you check the numbers, and it becomes just a permutation of, of numbers. And mathematicians use this um, fancy notation in, in the parentheses, um, just listing the <coughs> these numbers. So that just means that if you have just a parenthesis, that's just um, doing nothing. Otherwise, in order, one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to one. It goes back. So it's a it's a fancy notation. And now we can we can actually do this measurement. And we say that, oh, the left sh shape has symmetry, uh, Z3, which is just a cyclic uh, group uh, on three points. And in addition to that, um, the triangle has uh, more symmetries. It's exactly just swapping two corners. That's um, flipping over. And um, now we can say, oh, it's, it's, it's more, more symmetric. Okay. Now, this is, of course, a very special example because one symmetric, uh, one permutation group is a subgroup of the other one. In general, you, you, are, you have um, different uh, groups and you cannot say that one is uh, contained in the other. Okay, so here's the question. Uh, if you see many examples of, uh, of groups, and it's like your question is that, well, is there a universal representation? Okay, so can I just study? So, one type of groups, and I can study everything? And the answer is yes, and that's Cayley's theorem. And it says, it's a rather informally stated, every group is isomorphic to a permutation group. So you can come up with any set, set of symmetry operations, um, can be physical manipulations of this object, and we can turn it into a, a group, which is really just permutation group, just uh, uh, moving numbers around. And what is the main idea? Well, the main idea here is that uh, in mathematics, we try to do things in a very economical way. So it's like, you give me a group, and I, I have to turn it into a permutation group, so a group that just rearranges a set. And what sort of set can I use? Okay? And, uh, and you might say, oh, well, okay, let's just take the set of numbers. Right? Oh, but we just learned not long ago that Numbers, it's already a very complicated object, right? So I'm talking about this group, and now you're asking me, oh, I use numbers. Well, what are those? That's a, they may form it's a different group. No, it, it just says that, oh, we need a set. Oh, but the group is a set itself, right? We can just use the same thing and act on that. So that's basically the idea, and um, that's Cayley's theorem. But the, of course, the good thing that everyone knows permutations, and it's just the permutation composition, and I just highlighted one uh, path, how you add them up. And also the, the cyclic uh, notation is there. So yeah, we, we know this stuff very well. How about this uh, morphism and isomorphism? What does it mean to be essentially the same? And I say for programmers, this is emulation. Okay, So you understand that one computer can emulate uh, the other computer. Well, I mean, that's the, the, <laughs> the very idea of, of, of computers. And also, you have your favorite 8-bit machine, and now you can 
uh, have an, an emulator. So that, that's the idea. You do a computation on one machine, and, um, and you, you can have a morphism, and uh, that means that you can do it on another machine, and there is a very systematic uh, relationship. And um, I mentioned this last year, then this is usually presented in a, in a very bad way. Uh, you don't put the type information on, on the definition of a homomorphism. You just uh, say this definition, but if you, you make it clear, then um, you do computation in, in one structure, and then you move that over to the other one, and you want to do it there. Um, so if you really um, distinguish between the two operations, then, then you can see uh, that this is really just transferring uh, the computation. So here is a, the figure. Um, and um, so now I'm, I'm a bit vague. I'll just say computational structure. This can be a group. This can be a, a, a semi-group. And uh, for me, computation is composition. OK, so uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, abstract thing. But what I say that, well, if I have x and y, I, I compose them, and then it's just x, y. So now, if I put a transfer x and y to the other structure and, and do the composition uh, there, then, well, that corresponds to, to what happened uh, in the uh, source structure. So, but again. Uh, if you, have, if you think that, oh, this homomorphism idea is a bit uh, complicated, no, you know it uh, very well. OK, so Cayley's theorem. So here's an abstract group, which is given by its composition table. OK? And that's uh, really, that we really know everything about this group. We know how to uh, multiply uh, these. You might check that, well, E happens to be the identity. And you can also check that what are the uh, inverses of each element. What is this? Well, that happens to be uh, just Z3, the um, symmetry group of that uh, funny object. OK, so now let's do an, some observations of this multiplication table. And that's true for all uh, group uh, multiplication and composition table. We see that, well, really, it's uh, in each row and each column, you have all the group elements. Right? Well, it follows that you can have only uh, each one, you can have only once. So this is the once and only once rule. And why is that? Well, you can pick two, okay? G1 and G2, and uh, you can multiply both uh, by age. And uh, imagine that these two are the same, okay? Um, so then, of course, because we are in a group, we do have inverses. You can just multiply it by the inverse, and you do the calculation that, well, you end up having g1 equals g2. Okay? So that's the assumption. Then uh, we can have two different ones. That's just not uh, right. So that, what does that mean exactly? Well, in each row and each column, you have permutations. Okay? So that's, I mean, that's the Cayley's theorem is that simple. It's already there. It's uh, just uh, the group permutes um, itself, group elements. So now let's just make it a bit more uh, explicit. So every group G is isomorphic to a permutation group. So what do you do? Well, uh, for each group element, you pick G, and you say that, OK, uh, I construct this, this map, uh, RG, out of it. And that's just multiplying um, everything uh, on the right by G. Okay, and that, this is onto because it's difficult. It's not that uh, difficult to see that if you pick one uh, element from the codomain Y, you can figure out that oh, which one is um, which original element uh, will give you uh, the preimage of that. Well, you, again, you just use the same trick with the um, inverse, and we also check that it's one to one. Uh, that's the once and only once rule, and you put that together then. Well, you see that it has to be a, a permutation of G itself. There is one more thing to, to show. Then um, is this map that I take a group element in my abstract group, and I map it to this permutation. Is this a homomorphism? And it works uh, very simply. You just pick uh, any two group elements and see uh, it's going to be just a function composition. You put them uh, together. And um, you just write out the definition of, of this map. And you realize that oh, something is wrong. It's, it comes out the other way around. 
Okay? And uh, I did it on purpose, uh, because if you just read a group theory book, they either change the definition of order of function composition, or they, do the, they, they multiply on the left. So I mean, that's what I don't like mathematics. It's, uh, there, we have the ideal of, of covering the tracks. Okay? And that, that means that we assume that everyone has to figure it out themselves. And it's, it's rather difficult. So yeah, if, if you, you have a function composition uh, composing one way, and you have uh, this, um, this map uh, multiplying on the right, you might end up the other way around. But it's, that's just called anti-isomorphism. And if you know category theory, this is exactly when you have the covariant and contravariant functor. So it's, you have to do the housekeeping which way uh, you are going. And that's why you might see different uh, versions of the Yone dilemma, uh, depending on which order you go. So yeah, it's anti-isomorphism then. And of course, uh, you need to, to check um, the identity map and the inverses as well. But that follows from, uh, from that. And um, please note that we talk about two maps here. So one is that for each group element, uh, I have a map which is a permutation of the groups. And on another level, I'm talking about the map that takes a group element to these permutations, OK? So well, um, probably it's different for you. This was, uh, for me, this was difficult to understand in the beginning. It's like, uh, so one, one, once you understand that, oh, yeah, we have two maps, then it's obvious. Uh, but before uh, that, it's not too obvious. OK, so what's the Yonadai about the Scalis theorem? Well, the idea is that one group element uh, under this uh, isomorphism is defined by how it acts on all the other elements of the group. So that's sort of a relation, uh, how they work together. And the group is embedded into the symmetry group of all permutations of itself. It's not the same, because well, we have a lot more uh, permutations going on. So is how useful Cayley's theorem is. And does it give a nice representation? No, it's definitely not. It's just very nice in the beginning because you know, groups tend to be quite big. So it's like, uh, if you think in terms of well, the Rubik's cube, and it's, uh, let's do Cayley's theorem and that, then the object you have is a permutation of around 43 quintillion points. Okay, and that's definitely not what we do. Um, so. Uh, it is more like a, a theoretical contract um, construct in that sense. And actually, finding minimal degree representation. So now you ask the question, it's like, I, I don't want just any permutation representation of a group, uh, but what I want the minimal number of points you can act on. That's not a trivial problem. That's actually a, a research problem. Uh, but there are some very good tools. Uh, uh, we often use the GAP computer algebra system, and we also have a package uh, developed for other things as well, but um, does uh, this group uh, permutation representation as well. OK, so how about semigroups? Well, it's easy. Uh, semigroups are even easier because you, you just cut uh, the definition into one uh, a third of it, no identity, and consequently, and no inverses. But it's the same thing. And uh, well, you can go halfway between and you say, if I keep the identity, but I don't necessarily have the inverses. So I have to do nothing operations, but I might do some operations that I cannot undo. OK, that's the idea of the monoid. And why, why did I mention these two? Well, OK, let's just see uh, an example. We also have a full structure, which is just like the symmetry group. We have all permutations of endpoints. We can have all transformations of, of endpoints. And that's just, you know, uh, people know transformations as well. These are just functions, total functions. Ah, here's the, um, probably I've shown this before. This is where you put the abstract uh, multiplication table, just symbols, and the actual meaning of it. And this is a composition table. So we know a transformation. So does Cayley's theorem work for this? And, um, and that's, a, that's right. Uh, there is a typo. Here's the point that it doesn't work for uh, semigroups. It has to be a, a monoid. So as we have the same construction. Now the idea is that you pick an ar arbitrary semigroup element, and you see how it acts on the whole semigroup. And that gives you a transformation. And it's exactly the same construct, but 
if you check the argument, we don't have the inverse, okay? So we have to have a different argument. So if it's, we need to see whether this is one-to-one -one or not. You might imagine this right uh, mapping, it um, sort of collapses two elements, and it's not the case if you have the identity. So uh, it has to be um, a monoid. And um, therefore, we only have Cayley's theorem for, for monoids. So now, um, how to go from monoids to categories, okay? So this is one way, uh, one way to do that, and it's a, a monoid is a category with a single object, okay? And uh, since we have a single object, that's why we don't talk about it when we talk about uh, monoids, right? Because it's just a placeholder. Or the, the elements of the monoid, those are the arrows, and it's just arrow composition. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about this simple object, which is, uh, if you know, a bit of category theory, so it's, this is so simple. This is, these are not the categories you, you want to uh, work with, but that's, um, that's what it is. And of course, uh, you know, the same thing applies. If you just don't just have a single object, uh, you can have arrows going the other way, you can have morphisms, and that's another problem. We, we call it morphism, and sometimes it's really a morphism, sometimes it's just, we just call it a, a morphism, and it could be uh, something else. So, yeah, that's what we don't do now, because that's, um, you know, I, I wouldn't claim that I can do the uh, Yone Dilemma uh, in, in 30 minutes, but, yeah, we could do the Cayley's theorem. So let's just have a little bit time uh, for, um, for doing the meta thing, as the, the metacognition thing, how to approach abstract uh, theories. And um, I recently studied uh, the cognitive psychology of board games, and I found this term, progressive deepening. So how do grandmasters do uh, chess? And of course, they do some search uh, as well, and, and they use their intuition for evaluating their board position. So how do they do the search? Do they go down to one uh, path in the tray, and if it doesn't work, they try another one, and the best one is found, um, then they make that move. No, that's not what they do. They explore one possibility a little bit, then they go to another tree, explore another one, then go to another one, then go back to the previous one. Uh, why do you do that? Because you gain some more information in the other branches, and then you, you just propagate the information, and you can go deeper, and, and you know more about it. So how, how does this relate to this? If you want to understand mathematics, you know, you, you try one thing, and that's, um, you sort of get stuck, and you try something uh, related, but not, don't get stuck on that, and, uh, and come back and revisit. And that resonates with well what Susan said uh, yesterday, that revisiting the same thing is actually super helpful. And of course, here is the, the good news. It's uh, Eugenia says that, well, all you have to do is just, just really have to spend time with them. Okay, and these abstract things, if, if you spend time with them, then they become concrete. And um, that's how you um, progress in, in mathematics. Well, thank you very much, that's all.